this is your news source evening bulletin for today monday the 11th day of january in the year 2021 i'm gordon mosley reporting here's what we're tracking tonight four months after the gruesome murders of burby's cousins isaiah and joel henry their family and friends picketed the head office of the criminal investigations department over its lack of progress with the investigations with placards and a call for justice to be done in the matter, family members called on Crime Chief Wendell Blanham to begin providing them with information and updates on the investigations. They complained that the many calls to his office have gone unanswered. Mr. Gladstone Henry, who is the father of Isaiah Henry, told reporters that he's beginning to believe that the police force has given up on the investigations. He said there has been little or no information coming from the police. And we need answers. We want to know why these Mr. Blanamin accepting his call or telling us, giving us feedback about this, in, this um, investigation or whatsoever. And we need justice and we need it now. We need answers. We need answers now. We need Mr. Blanamin to come out here and tell us something. These two by life cannot go down like this. While there were several initial arrests in the matter, all those suspects were set free as DNA tests appeared to have cleared them of any direct link to the crime. No one has been charged with a double murder and there is no suspect currently on the radar of the investigators. Mr. Henry said his family remains full of anger and pain, but they are still hopeful that a case will be solved. Every life matters. Every single life matters. We are saying to ourselves that if it was somebody else in our authority, what they would have done. But we have come out here so peacefully for, this, for justice for these two boys. We are full with anger and pain because of the way of this investigation is going. Sometimes they pick up some innocent people and say they want to question them just like that. And these people and these killers left right out there just doing the same thing. The teenage cousins Joel and Isaiah Henry were found murdered in the Cotton Tree Bag Dam on the west coast of Berbiz. Their badly chopped and mutilated bodies were found one day after family members reported them missing. The Ghana Police Force has sought assistance from the regional security system and the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigations has also been contacted for assistance. The Ghana Human Rights Association has been pressing the government to assist in the funding of a forensic expert team from Argentina. One of the team members recently visited Ghana for an initial review of the crime scene. There have been calls for the police force to make more information and evidence available to the forensic experts from Argentina. There has been no move in that direction. Uh, this is not nothing easy. It's something that gives us sleepless night. So many times, so many pain when we reflect because we went in the Baghdad and bring out ourselves, our, our, these boys, Isaiah and Joel. And every time we remember these things and we ain't getting justice, it brings pain. It brings so much heartache, so much suffering to know that we are not getting justice with these boys here. The Henry family plans to continue their protest to ensure attention is always focused on the matter and the proper investigation completed. More news coming up in a moment. weathered every storm and risen to every challenge because it is the people of Guyana that gives it its strength all the people regardless of race class or religion we, we are, are one, one people, people one strength and now is our time a time to rise together we rise
Elite Fragrances and Tradings is your destination for the most luxurious gift. Deodorant, perfume, cologne, body spray, sunglasses, wallet, belt, spa, men hair products, and much more. Elite Fragrances and Tradings, 123 Regent Road Border, between Arnock Street and Shiv Shandipal Drive. You can contact us on 619-5151 or 227-1255. The perfect fragrance is the ultimate accessory. I wanna be a super 95 million. You can be a super 95 millionaire this Christmas when you purchase three thousand dollars or more. Super 95 fuel from Gaia Service Stations. Enter to win one of two first prizes of one million dollars plus weekly cash prizes up to five hundred thousand dollars. That's not all. Each week until January 15, 2021, you can also have a chance to win smart TVs, tablets, shopping vouchers, and so much more. So hurry down to the nearest Gaia Service Station and spend three thousand dollars or more on super 95 fuel and you can be a super 95 millionaire mom what are you doing with gpl on your list child you forgot i have to pay gpl you got time with gpl i have to keep these lights on the customers who think in that manner and refuse to honor their obligation to GPL are obviously not playing their part in ensuring quality service delivery. So I will continue to pay my GPL bill on time every time. I recognize the value of your point, Mom. You were right. Guyana's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hugh Todd, met and held discussions today with the charge of the affairs of the Venezuelan embassy in Guyana, Moses Chavez, on the latest decree issued by Venezuela claiming land and maritime space that belongs to Guyana. In a statement this afternoon, the Foreign Affairs Ministry said the minister registered Guyana's strong objection over the attempts by Venezuela to assume jurisdiction over Guyana's maritime and submarine areas, solely based on unilateral action without due regard for international law and the rights of Guyana. The foreign minister was instructed by the president to call in the Venezuelan embassy official as Guyana responded to the announcement out of Caracas about the latest decree. Let's tell you now that the United States has reinforced its support for Guyana in the wake of the latest decree from the Venezuelan government claiming land and maritime space which belongs to Guyana. The Assistant U.S. Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, Michael Kozak, in a statement on Sunday said the aggressive claims from Venezuela do not change a recent ruling by the International Court that it has jurisdiction to hear the border matter. The U.S. official said the claims by the Venezuelan president only show the world his disregard for his neighbors and international law. On Saturday, President Irfan Ali rejected the latest Venezuelan decree. He said the attempt by Venezuela to unilaterally fix its land and maritime boundaries with Guyana is a legal nullity, which cannot and will not be respected by any other state in the world, including Guyana. The second violation of fundamental international law is based on the fact that well-established rules of international law, there is a fundamental principle that the land dominates the sea. This means that sovereignty and sovereign rights in the sea and seabed emanate from title to the land that forms the coast to which those seas and seabed are adjacent. Since Guyana is sovereign over the coast west of the Essequibo River, as far as Punta Playa, it follows consequentially, consequently, that only Guyana can enjoy sovereignty and exclusive sovereign rights over the adjacent sea and seabed. And opposition leader Joe Harmon has also rejected the claim by Venezuela. In a statement, Mr. Harmon said the decree by Venezuela is mischievous and illegal and can only serve to foment tensions between the two countries. That decree seeks to renew fallacious claims to Guyana's territory 
and ignore the internationally demarcated and recognized boundaries between our two states. This decree is illegal and can only serve to foment tension on an issue that is being peaceably resolved in the International Court of Justice. The Ghana government will be moving to inform the international community and the United Nations on the latest actions by Venezuela. While well, a move by members of the government's side and the Public Accounts Committee to interrupt the committee's meeting this morning was disallowed by Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, Opposition Member of Parliament David Patterson. When the meeting got underway in the parliamentary chamber, government member Gail Tashira informed the chairman that the Foreign Relations Committee needed to use the parliamentary chambers for a one o'clock meeting on the issue with Venezuela. Minister Tashira told the Public Accounts Committee that the Venezuelan issue is of national importance and she asked for the Public Accounts Committee meeting to stop at 12.30 this afternoon to allow the sanitization of the room for the Foreign Affairs meeting. And therefore, I'm asking that the committee uh, raises, uh, discuss this issue and we make a decision. Otherwise, we will have to find another location. But the PAC chair, David Patterson, said while he understands the importance of the Venezuelan issue, the Foreign Affairs Committee could find an alternative venue so that its meeting does not interrupt the work of the Public Accounts Committee. There are alternative venues, and I'm sure the clerk is right now looking at those alternative venues. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to... Mr. Chairman, I'm putting a motion on the floor. Ms. Madam that Tashira... That I wish to put a motion on the floor that the Public Accounts Committee agrees to end at 12.30 to facilitate an emergency meeting of the Parliamentary Sectoral Committee on Foreign Relations to discuss the Guyana-Venezuela developments. Madam Tashira, I will not put that motion on the floor. I will not, as chairman, I will not put the question. Mr. Mr. We chairman. have, we have, we have sat here and we have agreed on Mr. a date. Chairman. And we shall, and all committees, it is, no, all committees are, are as important as each other. And um, I will not put that motion to the floor. Tashira sought to bring a motion seeking the committee's approval that the PAC's meeting will end at 12.30. But that motion did not get anywhere. Madam Tashira, Madam Tashira, um, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee just called, just texted me to say he will reschedule or use another room. Told me. Yeah, but well, just you are just like I was, um, Mr. Yeah, well, okay. Trump. They, just like how I was. At, well, uh, we're not, not rescheduling. Unwear. The meeting's at one o'clock. It will have to find, and, as you said, another venue. Another venue. We can go on the street Thank you, for, thank you, but Mr. But Mr. Speaker. I, I want um, to know, Mr. Let, chairman, you've been asked to say. Under what standing order you have disallowed my motion? Could you please quote that? As the chairman... Could as, you quote as... that? Government committee member Bishop Juan Agil complained that the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee was being high-handed with his refusal to give up the parliamentary chambers. Agil requested that the PAC chairman allows the debate on his refusal. Edgel requested that the PAC chairman allows a debate on his refusal to accept the motion to wrap up the PAC meeting early. But Mr. Patterson stuck to his position and moved ahead with the meeting. Opposition member of the PAC, German Figuera, said he could not understand why an alternative venue was not identified. The meeting continued in the same venue. The Ghana Defence Force was unable to provide adequate information to the Public Accounts Committee today when an 11-member team appeared before the committee for examination of the 2016 Auditor General Report for the agency. The GDF will now have to return before the Public Accounts Committee at a later date when the examination of spending by the force will continue. It was the Chairman of the PAC Opposition Member of Parliament, David Patterson, who recommended that consultations be held between the staff of the GDF and the Auditor General's Office, aimed at assisting the GDF to better provide answers to questions from the committee. The Chairman said the committee was not fully satisfied with the responses that were coming from the GDF for spending in 2016. I'd like to oh. make a, a, a proposal that, um, that we ask the Defence Force to come again. Um, and come better, better prepared. If because I can see the response um, that we can that will will we'll, we'll continue. Um, I mean that is a proposal. If the members think that they will get benefit by continuing, it, it is up to them. But I would ask, I would propose that we ask the defence force and allow 
Commander Burnett the opportunity. You, you've now seen the line of questions. Commander Vernon Burnett of the Gallant Defense Force, who was facing most of the questions, agreed. Additional time definitely will give us an opportunity to, to peruse all additional documents and even interface a little bit more with the state auditors who um, uh, who, who prepared the who audit. Also, right, who prepared the audit and um, maybe that will put us in a better position to, to um, provide more clarity to these concerns and questions. However, members from both sides of the Public Accounts Committee probed the GDF for answers into the spending of $8.5 million over a one-year period on a single vehicle. According to the Auditor General's report, the GDF was spending sums every month to repair a Bedford four-ton tipper truck that was being used by its 4th Engineering Battalion. Commander Burnett stated that the high cost stemmed from major repairs done and might have been the replacement of an engine. The high cost of maintenance was a concern for everyone at the meeting. The Gallant Defense Force has in-house maintenance and pre-qualified contractors. The need for fleet replacement in a timely manner was highlighted during today's meeting. Let's tell you now that Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony is encouraging members of the public to report those businesses that have been flouting the national COVID-19 regulations. Anthony's statement comes in the wake of the decision of the National COVID-19 Task Force to shut down the operations of the Hard Rock Cafe over indoor dining. Under the COVID-19 regulations, only outdoor dining is permitted. But while the Hard Rock Cafe was told to shut down its operations because of a breach, a number of bars and hangout spots have been hosting events with no action being taken against them. Although bars and hangout spots are not allowed to open their doors during the pandemic. Minister Anthony today says citizens ought to file complaints with the National COVID-19 Task Force. Uh, it's also people must understand too that we are in a pandemic and should also be re, you know responsible so if you know that uh, the order that the orders that we have put out clearly stipulates that there shouldn't be bars being open or uh, having indoor dining then why are you even uh, patronizing an establishment that is in clear violation of these rules during the recent Christmas holidays, several parties and events were held at various clubs and night spots with none of them being stopped. On All Year's Night, there were several street jams that continued into the early morning in Georgetown and on the east coast of the Marara, with no enforcement of the COVID-19 regulations. Guyana has recorded more than 260 new COVID-19 cases since the start of this year. Three more deaths were recorded this past weekend, taking the country's total death toll to 170. Almost a year after releasing a stinging report on Ghana's oil industry and the contracts that were signed with major companies, international non-governmental organization Global Witness has withdrawn the report completely. The report was issued weeks before the national elections in Guyana. The contents of the report were used in the political campaign and also formed the basis for months of discussions in the press on Ghana's oil industry and the management of the industry by the former government. But in withdrawing its report today, Global Witness said the February 2020 report titled Signed Away is not consistent with a focus on the climate change crisis and its impact. The international body said it is for that reason that it has decided to remove the report from its website and stop using it in its campaigning work. It said it regretted any unintended negative consequences arising from the report, including its stifling of debate within Guyana around actions to address climate change. The body noted that since it started its work in 1993, it sought to end the environmental destruction that harms so many people around the world holding the powerful to account while advocating for people who have lost their livelihoods or lives. The organization noted that as the destructive impacts of the climate crisis have become more acute, it has become clear that its work needs a change. Global Witness said its report focused on how much revenue Ghana could obtain from oil if the government had negotiated a fairer deal with the oil major Exxon. 
The group also noted that since its publication, oil prices have dropped by more than a third. And as COVID-19 continues to depress demand for fossil fuels, and as countries implement policies to restrict the use of fossil fuels in order to tackle climate change, the prospects for sustainable income generation from new oil projects are increasingly questionable. With all that, the group made it clear that its decision to withdraw signed away is not an endorsement of the way Exxon or Guyanese officials negotiated the oil license or awarded the contract. It said it stands by the integrity of the evidence that it presented in the report. The group also said it remains supportive of those who have been working to increase accountability around Ghana's oil deals. The Ghana Prison Service and the police are investigating the death of a 44-year-old remand prisoner inside the Luziknan jail. The lifeless body of Roger Samuels of Parfit Harmony was found in a cell at the prison yesterday morning. He was remanded to jail on Friday for the alleged theft of a motor car. In a statement on Sunday, the prison service revealed that Samuels was admitted to the prison on Friday with multiple injuries. He suffered those injuries at the hands of members of the public before he was handed over to the police on the larceny allegations. It's unclear whether he suffered any additional injuries since being admitted to the Luziknan jail. A post-mortem examination is to be carried out this week. of the global pandemic, COVID-19 across our nation, essential organizations like us have chosen to adopt innovative approaches to meet the emerging needs of our customers while protecting our employees. Here are some quick tips to make managing your GPL bill easier while we practice social distancing. To register for electronic billing, you can use the e-billing tab on your website to access your bill balance you can use four options, the website live chat at gpl.net, the online inquiry on our website under billing, SMS freedom by texting your GPL reference number to 624-0400 or 608-8400 or call our call center at 226-2600. A message from the Guyana Power and Light Incorporated. We are legions of men standing strong, but never too proud to stoop and help someone. We must send a clear signal to all. Do right. Walk in upright ways, knowing that's what being a man is all about. And ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing. Stand strong, be the one to live right. Been through it all. But as a people we have weathered every storm and risen to every challenge. Because it is the people of Guyana that gives it its strength. All the people, regardless of race, class or religion, we, we are, are one people, one strength. And now, it's time.
our time. A time to rise. Together, we rise. Across the region right now, Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister and current CARICOM Chairman Dr. Keith Rowley has been discharged from hospital and is now at home resting comfortably. Dr. Rowley was admitted to the hospital on Friday after suffering chest pains. He was kept there for two nights and was discharged just after 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Dr. Rowley underwent a series of medical tests, including an angiogram and angioplasty procedure, which according to his officials went well. The Prime Minister waved at members of the media as he left the hospital. A statement from his office said that Dr. Rowley was assessed by his doctors and given the all clear to return home. At least 23 people were killed over the weekend in a clash between police and gangs in Venezuela's capital of Caracas. That's according to reports out of the country. The bloodshed began on Friday afternoon with an operation by two police units, the Special Action Forces and the Special Tactical Operations Unit. The operation took place in a gang-ridden neighborhood of La Vega in the capital. Reports out of Venezuela state that there did not appear to be any police deaths from the confrontations. Venezuela is among the world's most violent countries, with a murder rate of some 45.6 per 100,000 residents in 2020. And that was according to the non-profit Venezuelan Observatory of Violence. And finally tonight, international news. Britain is on course to have immunized its most vulnerable people against COVID-19 by mid-February and offering a shot to every adult by autumn, with some 2 million people having already received a first dose, its health secretary said yesterday. Britain is battling surging infections but is pinning its hopes on rapid immunization to enable life to start returning to some degree of normalcy by the spring. The health secretary said around 2 million people had already received the first shot of the vaccine. For the government to meet its goal of vaccinating more than 14 million people by mid-February, it needs to deliver 2 million shots a week. The current rate is around 200,000 per day. And that's your News Source Evening Bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley, reporting.